features. It was characterized by providing access to the game through multiple sources. So for most, the majority of white cricketers, they had access to the game from family members. For many of the black African players, it was Cricket South Africa's Baker's, what was a mini cricket development program. It was the Baker's Biscuits program at the time. It's currently the KFC program. Some had access through their schools and some had access through their clubs. Um, and that was really quite important because what was also important in the early exposure was the impact of role models. And often those role models came from the same ethnic group as an individual or from the same cricketing disciplines. And I think it's really important at this stage just to bring up the importance of Makai and Tini for many of these young black African players. They almost all of them that he was there, he was their role model. Um, and because at the time that they were growing up, he was the key black African player who, um, who was playing. Interestingly, the average age of starting playing cricket, the average age um, was age six, but interestingly, the white cricketers started playing it earlier, followed by the Indians, the coloreds, and the black Africans started later. So some of our players actually only started the game, playing the game at age 12 because of the lack of early introduction. Um, so it's important that also the lack of role models or heroes plays an important part. And another factor that came across from these players was the lack of limited television coverage of the game, because at that stage, much of the TV coverage was on um, pay TV. Um, and so it was difficult for access to be able to even watch the game and learn about the game. And even for some players, obviously access to even having televisions um, was an issue. So at the early stages and during their early schooling from, and now from early to middle years, the early years is sort of primary schooling. Um, it was actually much easier for white cricketers to, to play the game than it was for some of the black cricketers, just from an exposure point of view. Um, the transitions to the middle years from middle to uh, from junior school into high school is actually particularly difficult for all for um, for black African players. What essentially happens is that if you play mini cricket, if you do not have access to go to a school that offers cricket facilities there, it is very difficult to progress because there are very few facilities for players who do not end up going to schools. This group of players ended up, the vast majority of them, and I'm going to show you that just now, they actually ended up going to models, form, or what we call formal Model C schools or private schools on bursaries. And that was a reason that they succeeded. Uh, but as we know, for the vast majority of South African youngsters, they do not have that luxury of going to a school with cricket resources. And that, and that was really important. During the middle years, these players continued to play the game and then they continued and the vast majority of them made it through. Interestingly, 60% uh, 60 of this group of players of 43 played South African under 19 cricket. And it was actually a fairly common, um, what was important was the ethnic distribution of those 60% was actually fairly, um, fairly, com uh, fairly similar. The transition from cricket into the senior level, and I'm going to talk a lot more about it, again was during different routes. Some went into Cricket South Africa's high performance systems, some went on, some went through to universities and then progressed that way. But the vast majority went through into the high performance system, which is really supports the vision that um, in order to succeed, you need to be identified probably during the high school years and it's, um, you need to go through into a high performance program. That said, there were four players of my group of who I interviewed who actually didn't play any representative cricket and they managed to persevere and they continued to play. So it's not a be all and end all, but it is the preferred, the preferred route. And then at the senior level, and I'm gonna share here, with the senior level, this is the players at which age they either made their debuts at the senior provincial level, what used to be called amateur cricket, and then at their fran franchise debuts. 
Um, and so all of these players actually made their provincial debuts and their franchise debuts fairly young because they were successful. If you look at it, the average age was 18.9 playing amateur cricket. And at, at, by age 20, on average, these players had actually played professional cricket. Something I just do want to highlight is on the bottom line there that the last line there, we talk about how long it took them to make get from the senior provincial into, profi profi into professional or franchise cricket. And interestingly, the white players took half the amount of time to make that transition for whatever, and those are the reasons, some of the reasons that we're going to address as I, as I talk about it. So it took them 0.9 of a year, whereas the black Africans, it was 1.8 of a year. Uh, the coloreds that took longer and the Indians um, it took two years to progress from that senior le provincial level into the professional cricket. So despite the fact that all these players progressed along the way, there were factors that were made it challenges and enablers that made it. And I'm going to just summarize here the distal factors because again, we we almost everything that you have heard in the last two days from uh, Professor Urdendahl, Advocate Aronsa and, and others <coughs> uh, is supportive of what impacted here. But really it is to say that the South Africa, South Africa's history of segregation, injustice and inequality has created a massive divide between the ethnic groups in terms of obviously their social economic status their opportunities to participate in the game and the understanding of and the attitudes towards one another's challenges and different cultures. And so our history has created some of that. The diverse communities with having substantial financial and disadvantages in economic status, the social challenges, logistics, and even differing sporting cultures, all of those impacted um, how these players progressed through the system. Um, and just I want to highlight a few specifics here. Um, some of those quotes talk about it. Um, one of them, logistics. If you're a cricketer and cricket is always, is practice takes place at Wanderers and you are playing, uh, you live in Soweto, you have to take a lot of transport to get there. It takes you a lot of time. So logistics was an issue for many of these players. Um, another area was obviously that the high levels of poverty for many black African players, um, even things like that came out were post-school financial issues. That critical time between transitioning from being an under 19 player into the senior level, which is a really difficult time in terms of all sportsmen to develop as cricketers and players. Um, very many of our players have to give up the game in order to uh, provide an income. They've now finished their school and they have to sort of get a job and many families say to them, now it's time for you to get a job. And so it's difficult for them to actually try and make it as a cricketer if they don't make it. Um, obviously, we're aware of all the social challenges and this all came out of the research. Um, high levels of gangsterism, drug abuse, safety issues in many of the communities in which our, our players grow up in. On the other hand, the vast majority of the white players do not have to deal with some of those issues um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so all of this would impact on the ability of players to progress. Even different sporting cultures, um, we're aware that soccer, most of the players, all these players played soccer and that was very much dominant in some of the communities. There were more role models available and even the socioeconomic status that soccer, you need a soccer ball and a, just a field to run around. Cricket is, and I think it shouldn't, is an expensive, is an expensive sport um, compared to some of the other sports that are available. That said, it is really important, the research to remember that there were, and we've talked about it, huge pockets of cricket culture within South Africa, strong areas of the Eastern Cape, Western Cape and Northern Cape and parts of Gauteng who have strong cricketing, um, cricketing cultures. And so that itself was also very important to, um, to understand. Um, so many of these issues at this distal level 
talk about how the perceptions of social, culture, economic, and attitudinal disparity between the ethnic groups actually contributed to how players develop um, at these distal levels and then impact the, um, the proximal levels. I just want to also just add, which is something that came out of the research as well, is that it shouldn't be forgotten that our changes within society are also impacting perhaps people's passion for the game. And by that, the players talked a lot about um, the role of social media, uh, that players don't necessarily want to hang around for eight hours on a Saturday playing playing a game. They would rather play a game that takes only an hour. And that is just across that's across all the ethnic groups that actually our society is changing. And so that is perhaps a risk for Cricket South Africa in terms of keeping people within, within the game. Um, also at the distal level is obviously the role of Cricket South Africa um, as they are the governing body of under which these players play the game. And just at this stage, when I talk Cricket South Africa, I also talk about their affiliates as well. So it would be the, the Western Province or the Gauteng Cricket Unions or the Lions Cricket Unions. I call it, I've lumped it as Cricket South Africa, but it's, it is Cricket South Africa and the, um, their entire, all the base, uh, the unions below them. And so I've just highlighted here some, these were the findings and the beliefs and perceptions of these players and key informants about the role of Cricket South Africa in their ability to progress to the top. And it would appear from many of the perceptions of participants that the effectiveness during the past 20 years had been insufficient from Cricket South Africa to transform South Africa, cricket to accommodate and develop all South African players and to be truly inclusive. So that came out. And it came out in a number of ways. One was in terms of the development program. There was a great feeling that after the hype of unification in 1990s, there had been a perceived lack of commitment and dedication of resources to the development program. So in the 1990s, um, the development program, the Baker's Biscuit program was very vibrant, particularly during the early 2000s, it had become less important was the perception of these players. And we do know again, and I think it was about 2010 where it was started to be revived again when KFC um, came on board. And so that's what the players really felt. And it was a really critical aspect, this development program, particularly for young black players um, to be introduced to the game because they weren't necessarily having the advantages of playing it, playing it at school. So that was important. Another aspect was that um, facilities or the lack of facilities in many of the black areas also bridged the divide, needed to be in place to bridge the divide between the junior levels um, and the quality of schools. The important aspect is that many of these facilities, and we did hear yesterday from uh, Max Jordan that there'd been a number of these, I think it was a thousand sort of concrete pitches. And whilst that was acknowledged by these players, a lot of the maintenance of these pictures hadn't been maintained. Um, and so that further gave a negative perception and, and another reason for exclusion. Also in terms of developing players was coaching in the black communities. There weren't sufficient um, coaches and particularly in the black areas, many of the black coaches were paid low remuneration um, and that really further impacted the ability of players to develop. I will talk about some of the changes that have happened subsequent um, to this, because this is what the perceptions were of these players. At the senior level, the amateur or the senior provincial structures and the remuneration for players at those levels, um, the players found quite difficult. And that was because essentially what was happening is um, with um, there were a the number of franchises that they, the players talked about and the, um, and with the senior provincial players, uh, provinces, what really happened was that some of the um, players in those senior provincial teams, about 50% of them were paid a salary and 50% weren't. And that was not necessarily ethnically different, but they were expected these players to be able to play um, 
They had to tra train as hard, but some were being paid and some weren't. I think the new structure of Cricket South Africa has will alleviate some of those um, difficulties. Another area that um, players talk very strongly about was the relationships between Cricket South Africa and the unions with their senior players. And it was appear that better support and more effective and proactive communications would very much enhance the relationship between all players and Cricket South Africa's organizational structures. Um, this was particularly at two times. The lack of support and guidance was particularly poor, they felt, during the transition from the under-19 level through to the senior level. And secondly, at times of exclusion, from the game. When players were injured, they felt that they weren't um, properly looked after. There was a lot of um, discussion that the ethnic target um, policy had not been properly communicated and that players who then lost their jobs or their contracts because of this were um, did not understand the reasons for that. And so they felt that there needed to be better relationships with, with the senior uh, things and that there, because of the lack of these relationships, there had been a loss of trust between senior players um, and the organization. In terms of playing contracts and remuneration, this was not actually a big issue. And I mean, I think the so, but just their their perceptions were around. Um, they felt that having contracts only for two years was too short. Um, which is interesting because in most sports contracts are actually for very short periods, but they felt two years was quite was too short because it, there was no security. Um, but as we know, even even in even in international football, I think most even Manchester United players they have short term contracts because if you don't perform, as we know, you're out. <laughs> but this was a perception from these players. Um, there was also issues around. The remuneration and the remuneration for these players was in comparison, not to other players, but it was in comparison to other sports. They felt that cricket players at the sort of franchise levels, they were not getting the equivalent sort of salaries compared to their peers in, foot, in soccer, football or in rugby. And so that was an issue for these players across the board is that they were paid not less, even though they were the same professional players that uh, the soccer players and rugby players actually were, were, were paid more, more than them. So that was just something interesting. I will discuss a little bit more about remuneration when we discuss the, um, the, quota, uh, the target policy. And then finally, these players also recognized um, that and felt that Cricket South Africa and their affiliates were not performing their respective leadership functions as well as these participants expected in order to develop the game and all its players. Many of the participants believed to a greater or less extent that the organizational leadership was less than optimal and that it needed to be improved so that South African cricket could actually thrive. They felt there was a need to have the right people being accountable, professional and proactive and committed um, to the game. And um, I don't think there's any more needed to be said along that. I'm now going to, if there are no questions on this, are there any questions? I'm going to move on to the sort of proximal factors. Yeah, well, go ahead, uh, Doc. Okay. Mm. Right. If we look at it, we talked about there are four key fa uh, factors or four key relationships that impact um, and influence the development of cricketers. If we look at it here, the first one we're going to talk about is family members are acknowledged as playing an indisputable support function in the development of cricket talent. And they have a direct influence on individual players. A strong family culture of sport and cricket was considered to be an enabler whilst a variety of family circumstances, finances, uh, family structures were often a barrier to progress for many players. Parents provided or family members because we included here not just parents but also extended family members because for many of the players um, they lived actually 
quite a lot of the black African players just anecdotally for you lived, lived with grannies, etc., as we are aware of. And interestingly of this group, um, who I interviewed you, not one of the black African players here talked about their father introducing them to the game, um, which was completely different from many of the um, colored and white players. And I think, as we are aware, <clears throat> and I think the number is about 30%, that only 30% of black Africans live with their biological father. Um, <clears throat> and so that in itself creates another barrier um, in terms of it. So player parents or family members provided tangible support, logistics and financial backing, as well as emotion, strong emotional support. Um, so if we look at that, but unfortunately, because of the economic circumstances, some of the social realities and the beliefs likely to play a part in distinguishing the levels of parental support. So if we can see through the diagram, because of our society and diverse communities, how this has impacted different, different families. And it's not that parents did not want to support, it was that often their different family structures affected their ability um, to support and introduce their sons to their game and then support them along the way. There were lots of these kids had who came from single parents um, structures. Also, interestingly, certainly for the black African players amongst them, I think if I remember correctly, all of them were first generation cricketers. So they didn't have the history of cricket. Um, which again is a difference between many of the, the white players whose parents had played and particularly grandparents had played. And so that, again, I think that quote there, I mean, it was cricket talk around the table. So many of the players were steeped in cr cricket tradition, whereas for other players, they didn't have those traditions. Um, as we are aware, a lot of the social challenges faced by some of the families that these um, players came from, the logistics I've talked about getting getting their, their kids to practices, um, having to collect, tax, uh, having to catch taxis, et cetera, in comparison to many of the white kids whose parents actually were able to drive them to practice, et cetera. All that played a part. And so it was very difficult also the different financial circumstances of the players. It was very difficult for players from black, colored and Indian communities um, to have some of the equipment, um, and their, player, their, their parents had to make major sacrifices because of the expense of support. And this plays out in terms of family in the fact that uh, there was a lack of private coaching. And I'm going to talk about that amongst many of these players because there, there, wasn't the, there wasn't the excess income available to have private coaching. And that proved to be a really important um, f factor, even in terms of equipment. You know, a cricket bat costs you know, up to two, three, and probably once you get to the senior level, four, five, six thousand rand. As one of the players talked about, you can buy an awful lot of soccer boots for the price of a cricket bat. And so that again um, was the also an important thing. All of these players talked about the emotional support and they talked really passionately about the emotional support that they had received from their families. And as I mentioned in many cases, of the black African kids, um, a lot of them was from uh, from their grannies, um, but really that that is really important. And they lots of them spoke about their family members being role models for them. So again, the role of family is important, and our different family structures and circumstances certainly could impact the progression of players um, from our uh, from different communities. If we go on to the next one, we talk about the schools. And I'm going to talk about where these kids all went to school um, just now, but I think what has really came out of this research from a summary point of view is the attendance at well-resourced schools with good cricket cultures provided the opportunities to participate, compete and develop the fundamental skills required of an elite cricketer. The current club structures and the quality of schools that are available to the majority of potential cricketers do not provide these same opportunities. The good schooling contributed to holistic development of these players. Um, and so if we look, I just want to share the next slide with you. 
is all of these players, this is where they went from primary school and then to secondary school. Um, so all the white players went predominantly from both primary school and secondary school. 100% of those players went to what we call formal model C or private schools. The black African players, some went at the A to primary school, 55% of them even went to model C and private schools. But by high school, that had grown to 82%. The colored players were slightly different, uh, 23 and then 77. Um, uh, then 54, the Indian players, they went to 20 in that group. So 81% of our sample of 43 went to either formal Model C or private schools. The black African players did that because they had had some success at, their, at primary school. They were awarded bursaries to go to these schools. And that is what provided an opportunity for them um, to grow. But what this research showed quite clearly was that this needs to be, the awarding of bursary needs to be done with lots of caution and very good mentoring because the players had a lot of individual challenges. They, some of them, when they went to the bursaries, they were, some of them went to on these bursaries to boarding schools. And so there was homesickness. Some of them couldn't even speak the languages. But interestingly, despite the challenges, they all said that they would do it over again because the benefit of going to these schools for them was the culture of cricket, the access to facilities, the good coaching, and the, the all-round ability to, under, to grow emotionally, educationally, as well as with their cricket. Um, and so, as we are aware, this is not available to the vast majority of South African um, youngsters. And the stat that I came across, which came out of the eminent persons group um, data, was that only between eight and 12 percent of South African high South African high schools have cricket facilities. And I think that was has again been addressed in the previous two days as well. That schooling is a very important mechanism for developing talent, but if the schoolings don't exist. Um, for the opportunity. All right, there we go. That was Cricket South Africa Social Justice and Nation Building Project hearings continuing today. And uh, these hearings on racial discrimination in the game began on Monday and will run until the 23rd of July with about 58 submissions set to be heard. Uh, we, we, well, the former sports minister, Nwanda Balfo, and researcher, Dr. Mary Ann Dove, who completed doctoral work into social ecological factors in talent de development were testifying as we've just seen. Let's take a look at this news now.